Well, it's good to see you. Glad you joined us. I'm definitely excited to have this conversation today. And I think uh, hopefully you are too, man, because I think episode six is one of those cool companies that I think everybody's kind of heard of. I'm not sure, unless you're kind of the nerd side, like some of us, if you really know exactly what you guys do and everything, but I would love it, man, if you uh, coming from the horse's mouth, if you take a couple of minutes and kind of give us the the rundown, your background, kind of where you came from, and you know a little bit about the company and what you guys do, that'd be helpful. Yeah, great. Uh, really happy to be here. Um, Brian Muse McKenney. Uh, I have been in banking and payments uh, my entire career, uh, working for banks uh, in payments, product uh, development and innovation, uh, large sort of international banks, City for five years, HSBC for a decade, uh, built and deployed payment products in over a dozen countries. And uh, my intersection with episode six actually happened. Uh, I was a chief innovation officer for HSBC's uh, global payments division. Mm -hmm. And we were facing a, an acute threat in Hong Kong. Um, uh, Alipay and WeChat Pay, they were bringing into Hong Kong their mainland super app uh, that payments was... Uh, really the, the 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 vital part of that had you know so successfully disrupted the Chinese market and we decided to to fight back uh create a uh payments app think uh like Venmo and PayPal sure and and so I was the CEO of uh, the fintech within the bank uh which was probably the most enjoyable experience of my career yeah. and looking up against who we were going you know I'd always built on legacy technology built on mainframe based solutions, you know, more monolithic, obviously had been, you know, trying to evolve and get better. But looking at uh, these two uh, super app, uh, you know, Chinese internet giants, we knew that we had a big um, disadvantage in technology. And so we were like, if we're going to compete and win, we've got to find a different way. And so we scoured the planet trying to find who the best payments and ledger infrastructure provider could be. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, as we were doing the RFI, uh, we got a last minute recommendation from a partner to look at this 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 uh, uh, scrappy startup called Episode 6. Um, story, right? Yeah. <laughs> they ended up winning the, uh, the, the tender. Um, uh, uh, and so I was customer number two um, of episode six. Um, it was the first ever cloud deployment for the bank. Uh, mm -hmm. We built uh, this amazing product on top of episode six's platform, ended up scaling that to take 70% market share, um, over three and a half million customers now in Hong Kong. Um, and that was really my first experience of building payment products on modern technology. And it was uh, really mind blowing to see how much more uh, power there was, how much more speed. It was this really clever uh, design pattern architecturally where we implemented episode six as a sidecar. So right. there were about five integration points into the core banking infrastructure that we needed to get right. That took about five months to develop, three months to test and deploy. And then once we were live, everything that we built was on top of the new E6 cloud-based stack. And that allowed us to move faster. That allowed us to really build great user experiences, everything in real time. Um, you know, what people come to expect from, you know, your modern fintech solutions is possible for banks to do. And yet it requires this new approach. Um, you know, moving away from, but not having to fully rip and replace your right. sort of legacy uh, technology. And so that's what um, really excites me. Um, HSBC ended up doing the Series A round for episode six. I was a member of the board for three years mm -hmm. and 15 years into a career uh, working on the banking side. I just knew that this need is quite universal for mm -hmm. banks and technology companies that are in the payment space. And so uh, just over a year ago, took the plunge um, into FinTech myself, joined as chief revenue officer. And and really we, what we have, it's, it's a financial infrastructure uh, provider, all SaaS based, API first, um, that empowers banks and technology companies to build card programs, 
uh, credit, virtual accounts, wallets. Uh, it's quite a comprehensive uh, product suite that we enable uh, banks and other companies to bring to market and then run and scale those with the bank grade technology, security, compliance, and risk that we all know is really important and recently has become even clearer for those who had forgotten just how important that you know bank grade security compliance is. Sure. I, my first question is a big one, man, because you got fresh eyes for me. All the fintechs and all the vendors think all the banks are old and tired and slow and all the fintechs and all the or all the banks think the fintechs are crazy and everything's messy. You got fresh eyes coming over. Which one of us is more screwed up? <laughs> <laughs> so my my personal belief is that banks are best positioned to deliver regulated financial services to customers, both consumers and businesses, small businesses, medium-sized businesses, large businesses. Banks have the, the right to win in this space. The charter, man. And yep. FinTech companies were able to bring to market better products. I think, you know, however you want to define it, they're better. Yep. Um, better pricing, more transparency, more real time, better user experience. Um, you know, the ability of just like a simple thing, like replacing a card or freezing a card, mm -hmm. you know, the things that, you know, you don't think are, are sexy, but actually make a difference. But then also the things that are sexier, like what we see with buy now, pay later and giving much more working capital flexibility into people and businesses. Um, and so, so to me, I think the, the, what, what what lights me up is is enabling banks to actually bring those modern solutions to market using modern technology. Um, I think that's the winning formula. Um, awesome. I think a lot of the, the the some of the fintechs that we see that are actually getting banking licenses and moving down that path, that's a really great path to market as well. Um, I, I I think the 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 sort of the way we've seen some of the the sort of um, quasi regulated players. Um, or the models that have the regulated, you know, sponsor bank more like buried down the stack um, oh. are showing that there's there's challenges with that model. Um, mm -hmm. Not that those challenges can't be solved, but I personally really like the banks going direct to customer with great products. No, we agree. I, I, we've talked a lot about if you just looked at banking as a whole and whatever model or mantra you want to take closest to the charter always wins. Yeah. I think that brings up kind of to the 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 crux of your earlier point. The charter always wins or should, right? And the distance from the charter tends to introduce less transparency where we have issues with all of our fun and favorite words, right? Safety, soundness, et cetera. And we get a lot of the problems that we've seen of late. So we're with you for sure. Yeah, one of the things that I think... Uh, is is missed in the marketplace is the how we do it. How do we go about that? Mm -hmm. So, you know, if, if I'm going to extend my banking services out to somebody, it's like trying to extend your core is really, really difficult. But trying to add a layer, and I'm, you know, correct me if I'm using the wrong words for you, but kind of a core layer that still sits at the bank that extends these services outward. Whether again, you know, I, I tell everybody all the time, it's like. Go to your bank mobile app or your credit union mobile app, and that's what you show the world as your bank and your app. We can do so much better. And almost every fintech out there just beats the pants off of us in banking on that front. It's enabling services and things that you have at your bank in a way that you can serve them up externally. So that whether that's serving a fintech or serving your own bank in another app in a different way and extending these products that are, you know, there again, I want you to talk to us a little about real time, cloud based, et cetera, all that kind of stuff. So that people can, I, I need you to help me understand for a banker to see and understand what the, the positive and the benefit of doing it this way is. Can you help yeah. me out there? Yeah, yeah. So I would say there's three models. Um, so the, the first is trying to extract uh, above your core um, some of the mostly information exchange Um but your, your, your accounts are still all residing on your core. Your functionality and features are all developed on your core. 
and you but you enabled it to be pushed onto an app, let's say, so that your consumer can see it. And I, I think that's the approach that majority of participants have taken, certainly, you know, in the last decade. Um, then there are these approaches like we got to replace the whole thing, you know, build a greenfield stack, you know, find a way to do a migration. Um, that is where I've seen a lot of careers go to die. Um, <laughs> tre tre tremendous risk, execution risk, financial risk, high cost, long timelines. If you knock it out of the park, you might be lucky to be done in three, four years, at which point the market's moved. Um, and so I'm a big believer in taking a sidecar approach where, look, you've got your core technology. What's one thing we know about banks' core technology? It works. It's consistent. It's resilient. Um, we don't have bank IT failures just happening, you know, on a regular basis. When you're working on technology, it's proven decades long, ton of investment to go in. Now, what's interesting is a lot of the sponsor banks that have worked with these, uh, you know, middleware players that that were bringing banking as a service to, to market in that model where the sponsor banks further from the customer. Yeah. Um, they kind of have a concept of this FBO model. But mm -hmm. what, what I believe is the right approach is be your own FBO. So set up an omnibus account on your own core, but then build out on a sidecar core, the actual account structure that is becomes the system of record for the customers that you're serving. Mm -hmm. That way you can still it. You can, you can still leverage the technology that you have today um, when it comes to the core banking functionality, the payments activity in and out of ACH and, and all of that. And yet on this new stack, you can build the products and customer experiences that are needed today to win. Well said. I, I think to your point too, a lot of people miss in the history book, you know, I mean, we're talking, shoot, more than 10 years ago, well over, where a lot of this spun up from in the earliest days of the FBO model, it was core pricing. Nobody wants to put, a, you know, a fintech teen savings account with a $9 average account balance and build a SIF record on my core when the core is going to charge me seven bucks, uh, you know, whatever it might be. Uh, and so when you looked at how do you run these models profitably, the traditional core infrastructure, to your point, but the core pricing was a heck of a barrier, right? And so everybody ends up, let's push everything over so that I can run one account, one FBO account and have everything, which is where the FBO, the subledgering, the chaos, you know, that yeah. distance that you talked about began to get further and further. And I, I always go back to I remember having a lot of those conversations with the cores at the time, you know, I mean, pushing a decade ago about the pricing. I'm not saying it's the only problem, but it's it was definitely one of the main problems that spun this world the way that it did. But I do think, to your point, we've had good positives come out of it because that gives folks like you an opportunity to step in there and build things the right way and how it should be. Yeah, well, one of the things, guys, uh, I think needs to be looked at here is just how we go about creating a new company, right? So when people say, okay, I'm going to go get funding. I'm from California or whatever. And I get funding and I'm going to create a product here. I need to be able to create this thing enough to be able to achieve the, the funding that I need to be able to take it forward. And so that's where, you know, the Marketo, Galileo, everybody jumps into this and says, hey, we can help you build these products. So you pretty much have everything seeded down to the product level before we actually go get the sponsor bank. And then we have to go to a, let's say an application process with the sponsor bank. And they're going to look at this and go, do you have this? Do you have that? Okay. Maybe we didn't get the correct answers there, but what I think we've all been waiting for is this moment where the technology actually shifts up to the next level so that it's at the bank level to enable companies to come in here and access these things to produce these products, whether that be the bank itself or whether that be a third party. And to Brian's points and tell me if you agree, Brian, I would tell you a lot of Findex you run into that plug in at the product level, you know, where, for whatever parts and pieces they're trying to do, when they play within the FinTech ecosystem and everything is real time, everybody looks at you like core system of record ledger. Why do I need any of this shit? Right? This doesn't make sense. And then all we know now, right? every third party is hot, hot. Why do I need this? Until you get to the sponsor bank point and you have 
sweeps that have noon cutoffs, right? And we have batches. I mean, it's it's a different environment. And so you see a lot of fintechs, and this is my question, Brian, do you see a lot that are kind of on that round two that are coming to you guys and saying, hey, maybe we need to have our own system of record and actually play in this game? Yeah. So a lot of good questions in there. So uh, to answer the question, yes, absolutely. The 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 bundled um, platform and sponsor bank package from uh, non-bank players um, is something that we're seeing increasing interest in moving away from. Oh, yeah. And, and, and I think there's two real benefits in that. One is if you're a fintech, one of your most important relationships, if not your most important relationship, is with your sponsor bank. Mm -hmm. So that should be a relationship that you're directly uh, managing, uh, negotiating, and owning. And the banks that are uh, moving more into this direct BAS model, uh, I think, really have an edge there. And, and, and that's an important part of the offering. The second is that um, you think about uh, uh, technology providers. Um, what are you actually bringing? Are you bringing a prepackaged solution that brings together multiple different value levers? And then it's like, it works like this. This is how it works. Um, or are you bringing a best in breed where it's your own technology that's been built, proprietarily owned uh, and run? Um, and within that, you have as a bank or fintech the flexibility to create what you need. Because within each use case, there are infinite numbers of variations. Um, you know, if we look at just like the card space, I mean, how many different types of cards are there? Credit cards and debit cards and charge cards and prepaid cards and physical cards and virtual cards and tokenized cards. Mm -hmm. And there's different rewards programs and different pricing and different interest rates and different uh, installment, buy now, pay later offerings, right? There's a there's a near infinite number of combinations just within cards. Mm -hmm. And so so what we believe in is, is that best in breed model where if you if you want to be the best at cards, you know, work with someone who gives you the technology that allows you to create all these different types of programs. Um, something I really love is real quick, real quick, Brian, but yet what do we do? we go out there and we offer the dumbest product alive, which is a debit card that doesn't do anything. It's basically replaced a check. And we're like, okay, we check box that and we move on. We're missing these opportunities you're talking about. Am I right? Yes, unfortunately. Although I would say that more banks are, are, are waking up. Like, so a great, a great difference to a debit card is a secured credit card that effectively functions the same way if you have an amount of money in your account, say $1,000, rather than attach a debit card, why not attach a secured credit card? That's limit is however much money is in your account, but enables you to build credit as a customer and maybe earn some cash back rewards. Um, that's just a better product. Uh, and so the, the, the banks and I think are starting to at different rates and different uh, progressiveness levels, let's say, wake up to like, there's a better way to do things than the way we've been doing them. And the ones that really take that and run with it are going to, in my mind, in the next decade, you know, be the winners. Yes. Yes. This is, this is great, man. You got me fired up now. This is what we keep talking about to people is that this isn't an offensive strategy any longer. It's a defensive strategy. And, and the really cool products, whether it's Credit Builder, you know, and again, I don't care what you think about Credit Builder or Buy Now, Pay Later or whatever you want to talk about. These new are getting your earned wage or different things that go on here. Okay, these are new things. This is not something that every bank offered. Hey, we have a, a you know, we can have an interest bearing checking account, right? Um, these are new products, new things that have been brought to the marketplace from the fintech world. And we have to embrace these things and decide which ones you want to offer and what you want to do. And also, I think it's really important that a banker for just a moment put himself in an entrepreneur seat and say, hey, I'm going to create a fintech. OK, do you want to offer remote deposit capture? Do you want to offer a debit card? Do you want to have you know these you know, credit build or whatever? All these little feature sets, that's almost another company, right, that you have to go embrace and work with their technology. So when they're building out these products, there's a lot that needs to go into it. 
And then he goes to the sponsor bank and says, can you help me out? And the sponsor bank's like, crickets. Right. And that's where you come in, right? Yes. And 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 so, you know, I think there's two models that 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 work for us. So one is, you know, contracting directly with uh, a financial infrastructure provider like us and contracting directly with the sponsor bank to bring that solution to market. Or for sponsor banks that really want to take the next step, why not build the stack yourself? And and when I say build it, I I, I more mean bring together because you're going to need the, the best you know card processing system, but you're also going to need a really good KYC and fraud system, and you're going to have great customer service. If you can bring that together, and as a sponsor bank, when that um, uh, you know fintech comes to you saying, "I'm looking for this," don't just offer them the charter and the license right. services. Offer them the solution. Exactly, okay. Dad. How many years? Years have I been saying this quietly on the back porch saying, when is somebody going to say this and figure this out? Banks should be not having a fintech show up and saying, hey, Mr. Customer, how about I do all this work and integrate to everything everywhere and take whatever you baggage you bring? And instead, they look at it and say, we're the commodity. You're going to work within the realm that I want. I have my preferred methods and force the fintech to use what they use. And if not, it's not a good fit. OK, but. Banks should become a distributor of the technology. Yes. A, a bank should be sitting there using you guys in episode six. And when a fintech shows up, they say, for your ledger, this is who you're going to use, right? Because, and and that way you've got the same system sitting on both sides. Everything from mapping to reconciliation gets clean and easy. Timing's not an issue. Right. On and on, right? Well it's said. Clean. Well said. That's perfect. And, you know, we've talked about this so many times that, you're making, as I'm the sponsor bank, if I get successful and I've got all these cool things going on, do you know how many, I'm having to write to Marquette, to Galileo, da, 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 you know, all these different players to be able to functionally work with my fintechs. Okay, that's one more interface that I've got to deal with, which increases the costs all along the board. And you're right, if you had a solution platform that you can offer these things up and serve them as a distribution partner to those, hey, look, if you think, I think people were in the right mindset that, we have to cater to fintech like a customer rather than demand more of this is how you want to you want to play with me this is how you're going to play with me right okay and if you took that little bit more of that attitude about this and actually had the solutions in place to deliver you are a distributor at that point which also puts all the compliance and this is most important right here if we haven't seen this one yet guys you've got to protect the consumer at the yeah. end of the day and that responsibility is something that bankers excel at and compliance is a strength is what we always call that. Let's have mm -hmm. compliance as a strength, have the record that you know, exactly what Brian's talking about. Put the record onto the bank, man. Uh, keep it. going, man. You're, you got us fired up. <laughs> well, I, I, what you just articulated, I think is the winning strategy. And, and we see some banks uh, like the new line by fifth third announcement yep. with strike. That's a very interesting development. Um, and so we're working with uh a community bank in the Midwest can't announce it yet, but in the near future, um, that they're looking at and, and and building towards exactly what we're articulating, and their team is is fielding uh, demand from fintechs, and the response has been great. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's it's a better solution. I think that's just the easiest way to articulate it. Um, it puts control, compliance, and the regulatory uh requirements and excellence in the right hands excellence um, which nice is with the bank nice yep. word excellence that's yes. well said man I, I think the 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 easiest pieces of the competitive landscape here that a lot of banks are missing in this this evolve synapse conversation is just kind of put a, a a black cloud on the conversation that i think is silly the real question is is fintech gonna go away no Okay, once once we say no to that, we say, okay, um, to your point, Brian, we've got fintechs that are much, much better at marketing and product. Fair enough. I don't think anybody's blushing yet. Uh, and on the bank side, we want to have our brand and our markets, which then means we need to go out with our products and get a heck of a lot better at marketing, right? And be willing to lose fortunes 
to go out and market make, right? As well as product that largely isn't available, right? Or certainly isn't our skill set to go push. And so you have an interesting situation where you're competing with a really high watermark or you could be sponsoring it. Why do I want to go to my, you know, what is probably a small footprint where I'm focused and likely within my own customer base and try and eke out a living and compete on things that aren't my strengths or my strong suit? When I could take what I'm strong at, charter, compliance, yeah, perfect, right? Right? and sponsor and, and play on that side and have them for the first time, we're not just selling direct, we have distribution partners and they look a heck of a lot like commercial customers. Well, you just outlined right there. So if you go back, I've, I've known Fifth Third and worked with them half my life. And uh, this is a great bank. And they, you know, they created Vantive. And then they spun off Vantage, sold that off to World Pay, ended up that worked out okay. Yeah, it worked out pretty good. So when you talk about selling your strengths, what they've really done with the new line situation there is kind of let's go back to the drawing board, do the same type of thing, except serve it from the bank side mm -hmm. and allow people to actually implement those that you know card programs or whatever from the bank as a distribution partner. Is that did I hit that kind of right there? I, I think distribution is the play now if done well distribution and your own customers can also be served in a more digital first modern way mm -hmm. so I, I i i actually see a bit of a both hand mm -hmm. um and w within you know regional and community banks there is a lot to be said for the local relationships and community impact that they bring, right? And and, and, and let me use a, a real example, and then I'll go to the distribution side. I think we're just fully in agreement on the distribution side. And on this, I just want to make this, this one point. So one of the threads I hear from a lot of community banks that I've been talking to is our older customers are very loyal and like what we do. We start providing services to their children, um, then when they go off to college, you know, we kind of never hear from them again. They, they don't necessarily close their account, but they don't use their account. Mm -hmm. Right. And so why not bring the type of solutions like a, a green light? I've got a teenage daughter. We use green light. It's a great product. Well, that'd be a very easy one for a bank to actually replicate, um, and even make better. Um, and so if you're bringing these products into your communities, as people uh, grow and move, there's, there's no reason that you can't uh, be with them as that growth occurs. Um, and so I do think there's also an angle in addition to the sponsor bank distribution to serving your customers better and getting loyalty, getting cross product, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, deepening of those relationships. And, and still experiencing uh, organic growth. Now, do you want to go and like do a big marketing push and try to like scale outside of your uh, uh, your, 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 your sort of community or region? That's a harder place, certainly. Um, and maybe there'll be a few that, that, that are able to crack that. Um, but even just serving your existing customer base better uh, with better products, especially catering towards younger generations as they grow, I think has a good payback in addition to the distribution point, which is, you know, it's a one to many. You, you, you have a commercial customer slash partner that you're able to get this sort of embedded sponsor banking uh, solution going. Their success equals your success. Um, so to me, I think the, the best banks will be a both end. I, I think you're right. I, I mean, look, we've all, I mean, it's the basis of community banks when right? we serve our communities. I think for me, it's, trying to go and have what is more or less a, a retail fight and go and grow through organic means there is a tough, I mean, it's a tough conversation because look, on one hand, I've got, you know, whatever products I may buy, whether that's online banking, mobile, whatever, you know, features, et cetera. I mean, I've got an, a fairly expensive lift to build a decent, a decent weapon that I might go out and maybe if I get really good at marketing, I might be able to acquire customers and do mediocre. That's expensive, time-consuming, risky, and not where my strengths are versus on the other side, this entirely different type of fintech, right? Instead of being the vendor style solution, this is a fintech that needs a sponsor. 
He just wants to give me a bunch of money for not doing any of that crap. He's going to do that. I like that. Right. So I'm with you, Brian, in the sense of we need to take care of our communities and do the, you know, the pieces that we've always done and what we need to do to manage, you know, our customer relationships. Absolutely. But I don't, me and dad disagree here occasionally. I just don't love that market uh, as the place that I would go fight when this other side of the world is just ripe. And you know better than anybody, there is a massive backlog. I mean, there's like a gajillion fintechs that need a sponsor bank for every sponsor bank. You know, it's an incredible opportunity. So I I just think it's an interesting time and an interesting market. And it's an exciting time to be in banking, you know? Brian hit a nerve with me right there because uh, I think maybe most people are this way. I don't know, but I remember setting up a passbook account with my dad. Uh, I don't know, like eight years old or something. And I think most people would remember the first time they set up a bank account. And I mean, you come home and it's kind of a big deal in the family, you know? Yeah. Maybe you got an account today, man. You know, it's like, hey, all right. All right. And I think bankers, man, they benefited from that so good for so long. <clears throat> and then you're right. People go up the they go to college and it's like, well, we can get a branch that's in that location. And then we get into fintech world and, well, I need these features. I want to get my, you know, my paycheck two days earlier, or I want to, you know, no fee overdraft fees for this period of time. Whatever. They're, they're looking for things now that their banker that opened that first bank account, we've got to disconnect. And so really what I think you hit there, that was so good for me, you know, Hey, uh, we're all in agreement where, man, if you can, Put a layer on your bank that allows you to distribute you know, embedded finance or other services out to fintechs and company, you know, other merchant customers. I think that's great. But to build on the relationships that you already own at a generational level, once again, like we did for so long, this is a really cool way to look at it. Hats off to you. That was good. I uh, I agree with both of you, and my heart is more with you, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> as, a, as, a, as a banking executive for you know 15 years i i, I believe in the banking story mm-hmm. um and 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 yet for it to come true new technology is needed yep uh, That's it. it's it, you can't do it on what you've got right and it, 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 to me, I think the maybe I'm just a little beat up over too many years of fighting the good fight, right? But it's, <laughs> it's, it's the the lift is larger than ever. The technology footprint is wider and getting wider. Uh, and I don't feel like we're closer. I feel at least in some regards, and this isn't, I don't mean anything to do with you guys, Brian, but just in general, I don't feel like banks are closer or that it's out there, right? So to speak, right? There's so much to part and piece together. Everything's expensive. Uh, you find more and more folks going to the bundled solutions from the core and, you know, certainly maybe getting the best bundle, but not getting best of breed in any given area. Yeah. But I do think if you kind of track with me, if, if that was the, uh, that sets up a great opportunity to go pursue uh, new business models. Think sidecar, start fresh in a fresh environment. We'll keep doing status quo over here. But work in a new environment and play a new game, it's a really good opportunity. So, uh, so what we get to do here, this is cool. Every week we get to go fishing and we get to go out there and we fish for new companies like yours and try to figure out what they're doing. And, you know, I shouldn't say new companies, but so much as new opportunities, right? And try to show bankers, hey, here's another way to look at this. Here's another way to do that. And I think the banker guy is sitting down going, show me the one that works. Show me the one that's going to you know, really make me money. And we all know it. Because we're in this business and we go, man, this is a money making son of a gun. This is a good thing. But when we get to the, you know, let's just say the web, right? Oh, my Lord, man. They're inundated with nightmare stories and dumb people saying smart things. And it's just like, oh, my Lord. And so there's a whole lot of misinformation, I think, or people that try to make a name for themselves where they maybe should put the microphone down for a little bit. Well said. Yeah. And I think that once we get clarity into, hey, banker guy, this is how you're going to make money at this. This is really a good home run strategy for you. And we can articulate that message consistently to where it's no longer questionable whether there's an ROI in this process for the banker. And then they begin to start smelling a little blood in the water and realize that, you know, we can kick the shit out of Chase and City and Wells Fargo. Guys, they're easy to beat. They just, they're bigger than you. And they beat you for so long with their branch model uh, that, that that's dead. That, I think that's a big thing. Of what Brian's trying to scream here to everybody is that, Hey man, that advantage is over. 
yeah. we have a new advantage. So I'd like to build off both those points and and maybe articulate a bit more on the how. Uh, I think people get get hung up on that. So, um, Tanner, I believe to your point, start with a single use case. If you're going to go down this path of we want to do something differently to mm -hmm. achieve different outcomes uh, that are commercially uh, viable and beneficial to us as a bank. Um, select one use case to start with. It, it becomes overwhelming if like, okay, so we're just gonna, we're gonna do everything different is very unexecutable versus choose one. Yep. Now, working with a company like us, not to, the, the, you know, little self sell, one of my favorite offerings we have is cards as a service. And it's a, it's a platform that allows you as a bank to implement any number of card product offerings. So that could be, your first use case is embedded banking. You know, you want to do a into a fintech partner that wants to launch a credit card offering or wants to launch, you know, some new card offering. Um, so that can be your first use case that you want to do. It could be an internal use case like a, you know, credit builder for your team, you know, Gen Z focused solution. Mm -hmm. um, but start with one use case, get that use case right. But have the design where you have your existing stack. Now you have your sidecar doing this one use case. You start peeling over. Okay, now let's do the second use case. Now let's do the third use case. And over a multi-year time horizon versus the, the, the approach where, you know, you try to do all of it at once. It takes multi-year to get anything. Over a multi-year time horizon, you'll find yourself where 80% of your business is now running off the new while only maybe 20% is back on the old. And maybe it's not ever worth migrating the 20% or maybe it is because this has been so successful, but don't try to solution for and solve the, the unknown that is years away. Start with something real right now that you know is uh, a, a problem that your customers or your commercial customers face and solve that in a way that allows you to then start moving towards this future, but in a way that you can scale successfully. Well said. Well, with a synthetic account, you're able to actually combine those. So, I mean, you don't have to make that choice, right? Is that, is that correct? That's exactly correct. So I'll go back to uh, my time at HSBC in Hong Kong. We create this new payments app and it's now three and a half million consumers. There's something like 100,000 merchants. How many core accounts is that on? One. Yeah. One core account holds three and a half million plus customer accounts because the system of record is the sidecar. That's where all the activity takes place. But there's this one FBO account that, um, or settlement account that is, is where all the money rests on the core. Check. Well said. Hey, uh, real quick, I got to give a shout out to my buddy, Steve Pontius that works with you guys. Heck of a good guy. And I wanted to give him a shout out. I, I think the world of him, man, he's great. And uh, I also have a secret for you that I figured I would reveal at the end. I actually sat on the board of a company that uh, use you guys. I won't name names or anything, but I'm actually, this is probably a oh, couple of few years ago. So I actually got to see as the scoping went on, what they're trying to solve for, right? And everything you outlined, I can at least, I can vouch for everything you said is true, right? And that's the model on the idea. And so they went down that path and I'll tell you this, everything went smooth. They ended up live, right? Everything's running today. <laughs> and that's a huge victory in this world, right? So anyway, I've got uh, I've got some hands-on experience, man. And so you got my vote and that's, uh, that's a hard one to do. That is a surprise. I was not aware. And now you have me curious. So I'm going to have to, do Never tell. after this call. <laughs> <laughs> you bet. You bet. Hey, I want to give you a couple minutes, man. We covered a lot of ground. I, this was awesome, by the way. I think we all think the same way and we're, we're focused and have our vision, our headlights pointing in the, in the same direction, which is always good. Uh, but I want to give you a couple minutes, man. Take final thoughts, anything we didn't cover or anything at all. You got a couple minutes, man. You got the floor. Uh, so this was quite extensive and uh, I thought this was a very rich conversation. And then, and I, I, I would just speak to those that are, that are listening. Um, if you're rap, uh, 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 dealing with some of these challenges and concerns, reach out. Uh, I'm available. 
uh, Brian at episode six.com. You can find me on LinkedIn. Uh, we're here to help. Um, you know, no matter your size of an institution, uh, it's a company that was, you know, built for banks. Um, I can speak from direct personal experience on the quality of that. And I would love to have a conversation um, and, and see what you're uh, grappling with and, and how we may be able to help you uh, solve that in a, in a great way. So um, even if it's just to bounce some ideas, love talking with uh, banks that are you know, in this space and, and working to solve customer problems. So even if it doesn't lead to anything except an enjoyable conversation, I'll be very happy. Brian, you should be at the roundup, right? Yes. Okay. This, this, I'll tell you what, I, that little conference thing is the neatest deal of just people coming together. I mean, you talk about some smart people having smart conversations. It's, uh, it's really cool to watch. And man, I'm glad guys like you are leading the charge on some of these things. Uh, thank you. Thank you. We appreciate you, man. Had a really good time today. You guys keep rocking and rolling. Let us know what we can do to help out. Appreciate the partnership and the friendship and all the goodies. And we'll catch you next time. Excellent. Take care.